Hi, welcome to Ask GMBN Tech. As you know, this is the Q&A session. You ask the questions and hopefully we give you something resembling an answer. <laughs> and don't forget to get involved in the comments down below because we can't make these shows without you. So if you've got any questions that you want featured, use the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech down below so we can use them. Cool. Um, I'll kick this one off, shall I, this yeah. week? Uh, so first question is from LAG, or Latch. Um, I've been riding my... Lady Gaga, maybe. Asking. I hope it is. <laughs> yeah. rad. I love Lady Gaga. Um, I've been riding my XC bike for around three months, and when I freewheel, the crank set also spins. Uh, I can't seem to identify which part has the problem. Thanks in advance. Loving the videos. Uh, well, thanks for the props, first up. Okay, so the first thing I would probably look at would be on your hub. In fact, if I go into the hub emporium quickly. So I've got an example of a rear hub, but this will be different to your one, no doubt, and it's cut away here. So you see there's a little seal here. Now this seal can sometimes get a little bit sticky, and if that's the case, instead of it just rolling, as it should do, and freewheeling, it will actually roll around. And as your cassette moves, and then moves, moves your cranks, essentially. So just a bit of routine maintenance, if that's the case. Uh, the other thing it could be, would be your uh, guide wheels, sometimes known as the pulley wheels, or the jockey wheels. So the two little wheels on the, on the derailleur that hang underneath the cassette there, as such. Check the upper one in particular, because that, that one gets sticky, and if it doesn't sort of rotate around as it should do, or it feels notchy, sometimes the same effect will happen. The chain would just keep bumping around, uh, which will move your cranks around. So hopefully that can figure that one out. Yeah, even some friction in the chain can do it. You know, if yeah. it's super rusty, it can push it through. Um, maybe give your bike a really good clean um, and, you know, move the chain away, flick the jockey wheels, try and check to see what's stiff and what's the problem there. Um, but you also said it's three months you've had it. Is it a new mm. bike? Um, if you've bought it from a bike shop, maybe take it back and uh, get it get it serviced. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really good point, actually. You should have thought that. Yeah, three months, definitely. Visit your bike shop. Um, I've got a question here from Lubo Attacker. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, Ask GMBN, hello. I have a Continental Mountain King on my bike, and I wondered if it's a good idea to flip the front tire backwards, like in motocross. Okay, well, let's talk about um, flipping tires here. Um, some people do it just to get some extra life in, in the tread, because obviously you wear it one way, and then you can flip it and get a bit of extra life. Motocrossers definitely do that, um, but they tend to do it with more kind of symmetrical tread patterns um, because treads are directional. So usually they're trying not to have too much resistance in one rotational uh, pattern because if you run it backwards, obviously uh, the counterpart is there is resistance, which you don't really want um, when you're powering your own bicycle. Um, we do talk about flipping tires for extra grip sometimes, but this is usually in the back because if you flip it and get that extra grip, you might get more traction. Um, but when you flip it in the front, you just get an extra rolling resistance here, which is just going to make your life a little bit difficult when you say, Doddy. Yeah, definitely. I mean, as you said, motocross tires are it's a different thing, you know, because you have got an engine to power you. So on a bicycle, the tire designers have designed the tires to be as efficient as possible. In fact, can I have, can I have that one over there a sec? Yeah. So I, I guess this is kind of similar to a lot of motocross style open tires. And all right, so you wouldn't really notice at a glance if that's one way or the other on a bike. But if you look close, this one's got sipes. So these are these little slots that are cut into the nobbles. And these are designed to make these nobbles perform differently in different directions. So for example, under braking, you would want the nobble to be stiff and dig into the ground, kind of like you would on a motocross bike for opposite reasons. Uh, whereas for traction, you want it to deform. So therefore, you have to make sure they're in the correct orientation. Uh, so just take that into consideration. Your tyre designers have done a great job in making the tyres look the way they are. Yeah, also, because you've mentioned motocross, um, I'm wondering if you've noticed that some of the front tyres have a really directional V pattern on there. Mm. And I know the uh, Mountain King has a really directional V pattern. Um, we could show a picture on the screen here. You can see it going down away from the rider, so there's no rolling resistance in the front. And some front motocross tires do have really directional Vs, which almost point back towards the rider. Um, I can almost guarantee, if that's what you're thinking, I can almost guarantee that it's still in the correct direction. You've got to think that a front tire on a motocross bike is doing a really different job to a front tire on a on a a mountain bike. Um, there's so much driving force in a motocross bike, just pushing bikes into the front. They're probably trying to resist that force just to stay in a straight pattern. So if that's what you're seeing, um, I wouldn't flip your tire just 
because they look like that. Yeah. Always go with the manufacturer's recommendations. You know, they've spent a lot of time and research into it, haven't yeah, they? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, there's no need to mess with that. Um, good answer, by the way, with all the motocross chat there. Oh, thanks. Um, so, D. Allison says, well, a couple of questions here within the question. So you've got, does it matter which gear I store my bike in? I've got a 1x12 drivetrain, and I'm wondering if it's better for the derailleur long term for the bike to be in the first gear, e.g. the smaller sprocket. Over the years, could this mean less wear on a derailleur spring? And a second question, with tubeless tyres, is it best to store the bike with a valve in a particular position? The valves seem to clog up over time. I'm thinking if I have the valve at six o'clock, it might mean the valve clog won't happen so often as the sealant can drip away. Not something I thought of, but it's made me think for sure. Yeah, I mean, if yeah, going in reverse actually with the tubeless tires, I have heard a few people reference that, but to be honest, I don't. And I'm just looking at Anna's bike. <laughs> hanging, hanging up there and she doesn't either. And no. I, I mean, I take my valve cores out from time to time uh, just to pull off all the sort of bits of stringy rubber that's congealed from the sealant. And I think it's a good habit for anyone to get into. So do yourself a favour, if you've not already got one, get yourself a valve core removal tool. Um, just a bit of routine maintenance time to time. Undo them, pull off the bits of rubber, bung them back in. Um, but yeah, yeah I, it does make sense. When I, I blow up my tyres, uh, especially if there's new sealant in there, sometimes I will give it a little sort of release of air just to sort of blow any sealant out really. Yeah. But um, generally, I've not really noticed much of a problem. But, you know, it's not hard to store your valves down at the bottom. It takes a couple of seconds. Try it. Let us know if it works. <laughs> yeah, and the same actually for anyone else out there. Have you had the problem with your valves clogging from storage? Um, right, so let's get to the other question then. So storing the bike in gears. Now, same thing, I've stored bikes in all manner of gears over the years, and honestly, I've never noticed any difference. But there is something to be said, stalling the bike, storing the bike even in that smallest sprocket, yeah, you can have less tension on the system. So in theory, it would wear your derailleur less, but I mean, how long are you planning on storing it? <laughs> I don't know, like, um, just being devil's advocate here, I've literally never noticed this to be a problem on any of the bikes I have, and they'll be stored in all manner of different gears at home. But yes, you are correct. It should, in theory, make things a bit easier on your derailleur. Mm, okay, give it a whirl. Let us know how it works out. <laughs> um, I've got another question. So I've got, um, oh, I've, I've lost the name on who, who asked this question. But uh, why is grease the common recommendation for bolt threads? Uh, in the automotive industry, we use anti-seize. Uh, it seems like most of the point of the grease is to prevent corrosion, which anti-seize is designed to do as well. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, let's just explain the difference here. So grease is, well, it's grease. It prevents corrosion between metals. So it performs a, like a protective layer to stop the elements getting in. So it, it makes it nice and easy to screw bolts in and to get them out because they've not corroded and seized together effectively. Um, now, anti-seize, we do use that in the bicycle industry. Park tool make an anti-seize. Um, it's basically grease as well. It's got those anti-corrosion properties, but it's got uh, solid um, properties in solid content in it, uh, which basically makes it a lot thicker um, and it's good for kind of talking up bolts, basically. Um, so there's no reason to not use anti-seize on bolts in the bike industry. Um, there's no reason to not use grease either. Uh, if people are recommending grease, maybe they're just using that as a bracket term, for, and maybe they are using anti-seize. I mean, I um, guess I guess it depends how, how equipped you are at home and mm, what you want to yeah. spend. If you can only use one thing, a grease can be used on other things as well, like bearings and things. Mm. Whereas anti-seize, you should only use it on threads, really, I guess. Yeah, exactly. So, so people well, can just actually, have one in their toolbox. I and made a lie there. Because technically, you should use it on seat posts on, I don't know, like an alloy post in a titanium frame or something like that. Um, well, yeah. Just because the anti-seize properties by nature. But if you can have both, that's the ideal world. Well, that's guess, great, yeah. I mean, maybe that's why the automotive industry uses anti-seize more, because they're talking things up a lot yeah. higher, aren't they? So maybe it's more beneficial, whereas on bicycles, we're not talking them up so high, are we? So yeah. it's, not, it's not a bad thing not to use it. It's just ideal if you can. There's also my little friend, Threadlocker. Oh, yes. <laughs> which I think some people forget about. Uh, there's certain things, because you're using tiny bolts that can be prone to rattling loose over time, uh, jockey wheels, the guide wheels on your derailleur, uh, they can be known for it, these little ones down here. So think about it. That is a tiny little bolt. If you put it together with anti-seize or grease, there is a slim chance that it could back itself out over time. 
use some blue, like medium strength thread lock on there. It's more appropriate for the job. And that probably would be the case for a few things, like any bikes running uh, multiple chain rings, we use chain ring bolts. Same sort of thing, you'd want to use a thread lock on there rather than using a grease if possible. Um, I think we, we did make a video on greases and assembly compounds and uh, like carbon compounds and stuff as well. Uh, that should be in the link in the description underneath just to help you out there. Yeah, so no reason not to, but yeah. Okay, next one's from Sean Tweddle. Out of curiosity, what makes a good frame? Is it simply down to how expensive it is or the brand? Um, I'm not looking to upgrade, but just good to know for the future. That's quite a good question, actually. There's a lot to go into here. Well, yeah, you might get a different answer from every rider you ever ask, I think, yeah. on that question. Yeah, I mean, I think foremost is the geometry of the bike, because you could have a frame that's very expensive with poor geometry, and it's technically not going to be a good frame. You could also say, a cheap frame, as excellent as it could be, if you run into problems with it, maybe cracking it or getting damaged to it. If it's a very small brand, uh, they might not be able to support you with after sales service. So for example, I know I just throw Giant or Trek out there as examples of massive brands, uh, they might have a better aftermarket service for you. Uh, so that would also qualify as a good frame technically on a bit of paper. I mean, what do you think? There's a lot of things to consider Yeah, there. I mean, it depends. I, I think a good frame is one that suits you. I mean, it sounds sounds silly, it sounds obvious, but, you know, if there's no point buying an enduro bike here or an enduro frame if all you're doing is riding bridleways and doing cross-country. So yeah. a good frame to me is one that suits your style of riding and also, you know, fits you. Don't go out and buy one in the sales uh, that's a medium if you're a small because it's just not going to work out. That's not work. a good frame at the end of the day. But, um, but yeah, I mean, expensive, cheap. Uh, Maybe that would matter for a kind of a steel bike or a titanium bike, you know, when you get into the expensive end, there's, you know, better welding, maybe they'll last a little longer in the welds, but yeah, it's a, it's a really debatable one there. It is, yeah, it can go so many different ways. I mean, I think the best thing you can do is give, be the most informed person you are, so to give yourself the knowledge so you can make a better choice. And some ways of doing that would be to look at various videos and see what people are riding and try and figure out why. Try and identify who you are as a rider, because uh, you don't want to buy, I don't know, like a six inch travel bike if all you're doing is leisurely rides through the forest. It's just overkill and arguably it's going to cost more money as well. Um, look at what your friends are riding and any group rides that are local to you, perhaps your local bike shop if you have one, they'll be running group rides. If you look at the pattern of what the other riders are using for your local terrain, there'll almost be a brand or a style of bike amongst them that'll be more common than the others. And that's a good indicator of where you should start looking, I mm. think. Yeah, and he's mentioned upgrading the frame, but not necessarily the parts. So this is gonna whittle down what you can actually buy anyway. You know, if you've got a 150 mil suspension forks and 29er wheels, mm. then that's gonna narrow your field down because you won't be able to buy a 650B frame or with shorter suspension, for example. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, all of those things. Um, and also, don't get carried away with uh, components too much within reason. Something like a suspension fork is a serious amount of money to spend. Uh, but all the, the transmission, the drivetrain stuff, all of this, this is just consumable parts. These are going to wear out and they're going to break over time. So the frame is really important. Uh, your fork is really important as well. Uh, and to a degree, your wheels are. You look after the wheels that can last you a long time, but the rest of the stuff does wear out as you use it. Uh, so just give yourself all the information you can and start to form an opinion of, of where you want to go, I think. Mm, yeah, it's pretty hard to buy a bad bike these days, though, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, really? I'll tell you what, that's a really good point. So when I started doing bike reviews as a journalist um, many moons back, some of the bikes we used to get sent into the magazines were awful. They were so bad that we wouldn't even feature them because you didn't want to waste paper on them, basically. But these days, honestly, it's really difficult to get a bad bike. Most bike brands out there are offering really good stuff. So there's never been a better time, I think, to try and pick a new bike. Mm. Uh, so I've got another question here um, from Gasper Tola, or Jasper Tola. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Ask GMBN Tech, is it okay to use compressed air on the chain and bearings uh, after washing a bike to dry them off? Will it push the water out off the moving parts or just push it deeper into the bearings? Um, yeah, I mean, you can use compressed air on the chain. That's not really a problem. You just want to avoid getting it in places uh, like your bearings because that can, you know, force out the grease and all the goodness out of it. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, it's, it's not a problem. I've seen the World Cup cross-country mechanics doing it all the time. <laughs> 
<laughs> but then they change the bearings after every ride, so it makes no difference. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, your sealed bearings have got these nice seals on to keep the grease in there. Uh, but you, if you flush it out with water, with a jet wash or with air, mm. it's not going to be doing any good. Yeah, that's a great point, that. Um, I've got a question from Michael Ganawan, actually. This one's a good one. Why don't all bikes come with pedals? This is, this is quite a good question, actually. <laughs> we so, had a bit of a debate about this, yeah. didn't we? So and this goes in a few different ways. So the pedals that many bikes are shipped with um, are kind of like, I don't know, when you buy a hi-fi component, it comes with some crappy cables. Yeah, you know, it's to make it functional. It's not necessarily the cables you're going to want to use to listen to the good quality high fidelity music. It's the so, DJ coming out and you Yeah, it's, it's, it's the same thing. You know this, you've got some good speakers, I've seen your setup. <laughs> so it's the same thing. It's a set of pedals to make a bike functional um, because of the fact that pedals are one of the most picky things. You know, what I love in a pedal will be completely different, I'm certain, to many of you out there. So it's literally to make them functional, but it does bug me because um, many brands are now choosing to not supply pedals with bikes, which is a good thing because you're not ending up with landfill because those pedals that make that are functional, they're one of the first things that will break or that will just get thrown in a bin. So it's kind of good that they're not being shipped with them, but also bad. Yeah, so let's be honest, ways. Like, who's using those little plastic flat pedals anyway? I mean, personally, I run clipless, so straight away there's that debate. Do the, do the brands supply with clipless pedals? Do they supply with flats? And even when you go into the clipless realms, there's so many different types. There's different brands that have different mechanisms. Some have bigger plates, some have smaller plates. I just think there's too much variety in pedals, and it's so personable as well. It's like supplying a, a pair of shoes with your, your bike, you know? Everyone's different, there's no one size fits all. Uh, yeah, I just think there's way too much variety to supply pedals these yeah, days. Yeah, I, I completely agree, but I would like to see, just from a consumer point of view, thinking about this, because it would drive me mad. If I was going out to buy a mountain bike tomorrow <laughs> and I had 400 quid to spend on a mountain bike and it didn't come with pedals. Are you I, telling me you're riding that home from the shops? You're not putting it in the back of a car here. I'm just saying, just throwing it out there, I'd be, I'd be pretty hacked off. I'd like, I'd like the manufacturer, I mean, most bike shops, to be fair, are really good with this, and they'll make the right recommendation to help you out. And uh, you might even get a little discount for buying the bike there anyway. Uh, it feels like the manufacturer of the bike should be doing something along those lines. I'm gonna ask a few questions to manufacturers on do this. Do it, do yeah. it, let's ask them why. Um, I'm gonna jump straight to the next one, if that's all right with you. Yeah, go for it. Uh, this one's for 900 RS. When running a single ring chain up, <laughs> I wanna go again. When running a single chain ring setup, what's better, 30 tooth or a 36 tooth chain ring? That's a big um, jump right there. <laughs> like, how did you get that? Like, do you not like your knees or something? <laughs> so, yeah, how strong are your legs? How long are your cranks? What cadence do you like to ride at? How big are the hills you're riding? This is like, how long's a piece of string? This sort really of question. Debatable. Yeah, I mean, I, I like a 34 tooth chain ring on most bikes that I've got a 12 speed setup on the back, and uh, maybe a 32 on some bikes as well. Mm, yeah, I usually run a 32 or a 30. I'll even take a 28 if I'm going to the Alps and I'm yeah. pedaling up. Winch in power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just be just be easy on yourself. I mean, uh, when, when, where did you get 30 to 36? I was why ask that, why yeah. that option? Why, yeah, why the 36? <laughs> 36 is a big size. You must like really hate your knees. Ouch, I don't think even EWSs really run more than the 34. I do know someone that likes a 36 and they'll even put a 38 on his bike because he definitely hates his knees. Uh, that's Finn from Full Factory Suspension. Um, I, I've, I've always been puzzled why. I know, I know he can, he can turn those gears over, but like, dude, like, come on, you're old enough that your knees are going to start wearing out soon. Do yourself a favour. <laughs> <laughs> maybe try a couple out, you, you know, but maybe go up in your next increment, you know, by an extra two teeth, yeah. and see how that is first. Uh, that's my that's, Yeah, no, that's it. I can't add anything to that. Um, 30 to 36 is a massive jump. Yeah, do it incrementally and see what other riders are riding locally. I'll give you a clue what works. Okay, so we've got a question from Get Out and Ride MTB. Great name there. Um, Ask GMB and Tech, on older bikes in the early 2000s, I noticed that we see a lot of interrupted seat tube frame designs, uh, but we don't see them much anymore. Why is this? Yeah, he's absolutely right, isn't he? It's, yeah. It's changed I mean, a lot. I mean, there's, there's lots of things to consider here. So on downhill bikes, you will see it, but that's mainly because of the fact the wheel, the wheel is moving so much with the suspension travel that you have to accommodate that somehow. So the frame will be interrupted. But bearing in mind that you don't really sit down on downhill bikes, it's not important. Whereas, yeah, you're right. There was a patch, I don't know, from like 2000 to 2010 or so, where loads of bikes had interrupted seat tubes. Um, quite often, this was when we didn't have dropper posts. 
as well, so it made it even more infuriating. If you had to lower your saddle, you'd have to pre-chop it a certain amount as well. I can only think it was just, there was so much experimentation with frame design and suspension design, um, monocoque front ends, all sorts of different things going on at once that no one really found the right way. And I think since the dropper post has become king, it's been important to sort of accommodate um, a full length seat post in there really. Yeah, I mean, back in the day, it was kind of solving a problem like saddles uh, getting buzzed from back wheels yeah. or trying to move shocks into a nicer place for better suspension or just better access to shocks. Um, but these days, I think our love affair with dropper posts has kind of changed that, really. Yeah. People want straight tubes so that they can get the dropper post right in there so that there's clearance, you know, when the dropper's out. So I don't think that it was a bad frame design um, in the past. I don't think we've changed it. It's just that we've favoured dropper posts more than, you know, so solving the problem with, you know, saddle buzz or yeah, things like that. Exactly. Really. Yeah, I think, yeah, things have just progressed and I've got to say, I think they look nicer with without yeah. an interrupted seat design. It looks a bit cleaner and tidier. It looks a bit more complete. Um, yeah, that's about it, really. Yeah, and, yeah, for um, sure. Well, I think that's the end of this week's Ask GMBN Tech. Uh, as always, get the questions in in the comments underneath. Leave us some thumbs up and good feedback. And we'll see you in the next show soon. See you later.